Good evening, everyone. We're just going to uh, wait a couple more minutes as folks join the meeting. All right, it looks like we've got a pretty good uh, crowd here. So I think I think we're going to get started um, if that if that works for the team. Let me know if team if if I should hold. Otherwise, we'll um, we'll get we'll get right into it. I, I want to let everyone know. Um, I think you probably got a message when you joined that um, the, the meeting is being recorded. Um, so just want to make sure everybody's aware of that and comfortable with that. Uh, my name is Scott Hamway. I'm the uh, director of uh, bus modernization for the MBTA. Um, I'm going to start the meeting off tonight, um, and then I'm going to hand it off to Steve Belanger, who I think uh, many of you have met at, at prior meetings. Um, he's going to handle the bulk of the presentation. He's the project manager uh, for the MBTA for the Quincy uh, bus maintenance facility. Um, so he'll take us through the rest of the program. We've got a number of other folks from the team here, um, including uh, Katie Zazera, who's our manager of stakeholder engagement uh, for capital delivery at the T. Alexander Markevich, who's the manager of the bus program, working with me. I uh, believe we may have uh, Richard Henderson um, here from our real estate team and Michaela Combs uh, also helping out with, with the meeting tonight. So uh, thanks everybody on the team. Um, 
I wanted to just, uh, before we uh, get started, uh, just recognize at least a couple of the elected officials who've joined us tonight, at least those that I saw um, kind of filter in through the waiting room. So I wanted to thank uh, Representative Chan uh, for joining us tonight, um, Councilor Fallon, and also uh, special special thanks and, and greetings to Councilor Palmucci, um, whose district the facility's in and who's been a, a great uh, partner uh, throughout throughout the process um, uh, for us. So um, I, I apologize if I missed anyone and I will um, definitely um, definitely give a shout out if, I, if I'm made aware that anyone else has, has joined the meeting. So what we're gonna do tonight, uh, just to give you an overview of the plan uh, for the evening, um, we're gonna uh, give you an update on the design. Steve will update you on the design, discuss uh, some of the upcoming activities that are gonna be happening uh, on the site, um, as well as review the, um, you know, the project status updates, things that have happened since the last time uh, we came out and met with all of you, which which is now uh, going on almost a year, last December uh, we were out. And then we're gonna leave as much time as we can to give all of you an opportunity to provide um, feedback. We're gonna do a QA and a session after the presentation, which I'll describe in a minute. Um, but but just wanna start by thanking everybody for taking time out of your evenings to, to join us um, tonight and, and apologize that we're not able to do this in, in person. Um, so the Q&A process, just so everyone's comfortable with it, it's the same system we've used the last couple meetings on this facility. Uh, but but during during um, the Q&A, you'll be able to, to raise, there's a raise hand button that you'll be able to use to ask a question. Um, you can also type questions into the chat box, which I've been seeing that many of you have, are, are already doing. Um, um, or if you're on the, for those of you on the phone, I think we might have a couple of folks uh, on the phone. Um, you can you can press uh, star nine to raise your hand if you if you're on the phone. Um, so um, and and send questions through the chat uh, to the hosts and we and we'll and we'll 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 be able to get get to all of them and we'll we'll kind of alternate between folks who you want to ask their questions in in real time versus those who are submitting um, the chat. Um, but we're gonna call on you in the order you raise your hands um, and then you'll need to be um, wait until you're recognized by the team and then we'll unmute you. And then you can you can share your your question, um, and and then as I said, we will be we will be working through the the chat uh, comments and answering those as as we go along in the in the order that those are received um, as well. So that's the that's the plan for the meeting, and it, it worked pretty well last time. Hopefully, we won't have any issues tonight, but definitely uh, let the team know if if, if we do. So um, I guess we go to the next slide, which is the the agenda. This is just the. Um, yeah, just I'm going to give a, a just a quick update on the overall program that the Quincy facility is the first step in, and then really Steve's going to take us through the bulk of the presentation, talking about uh, specifics on the facility, um, and then we'll we'll talk about the project timeline going forward, and then and then take your questions. So if we go to the next slide. Um, right, so this is the program that Alexandra and I have been working on the last couple of years. It's and the Quincy bus maintenance facility. It's it's really the first step in what's going to be a two decade long journey that we're taking to modernize all nine of our uh, all nine of our MBTA bus facilities. And we we think the focus on bus is, is a really important and, and long overdue um, area for us for us to focus on, given the role that the bus plays in our system. So it, it carries a large proportion of our customers who really don't have other options and, and really depend on the bus for their ability to get around. Um, it's also our most flexible service. So when we have changes in demand or, or changes in sort of act, activity centers, the bus is really the easiest way for the MBTA to respond to those changes in demand. And it's also a very resilient mode, which we saw uh, unfortunately through COVID um, where, where bus service and our ridership, we retained our ridership on the bus to a much greater degree than we did on any of our other services, including um, the red line and the commuter rail um, across the street. Um, so, and, and, and really like one of the, the sort of primary goals of the program or the overarching uh, goal of the program that we talk a lot about is, is its role in supporting our carbon reduction goals that the Commonwealth has. Um, and, and we're doing that by electrifying our entire bus fleet. So we're very excited that Quincy is gonna be that first modern all battery electric bus facility. Um, we think that's a really exciting thing for Quincy and for us. But as important as that goal is, we always try to, you know, remind folks that we can't lose sight of some of the other other priorities that are also important. Um, building new facilities like this Quincy facility is going to allow us to give our workforce the tools that they need to be able to effectively and efficiently do their job, which is going to help. 
Um, it's also going to allow us to, to, to make sure we can keep buying the, the newest uh, vehicles that are out there, um, replacing our oldest vehicles in the fleet, like those that we currently operate out of Quincy. And by rebuilding Quincy a little bit bigger than the facility we're replacing, it's also going to allow us to grow in the future um, to help support uh, some of the growth, all that, all the all the growth that all of you uh, living in Quincy have been have been seeing the city experience. Uh, the next slide is just a couple of images that really kind of tell the story. Um, pictures worth a thousand words. It kind of tells the story for why Quincy was our first step in the program. It's it's our oldest facility, over a hundred years old, um, and due to some of the physical constraints in the facility, it's, it's vertical clearances in particular, we're really unable to, to do, um, to store anything or maintain anything other than the oldest buses in our fleet, the oldest and, and oldest diesel buses in our fleet. Um, and the, the aerial image on the left kind of also shows you that we're really kind of hemmed in on all sides by either you know, houses or roadways or, or the stadium or, 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 um, or the water. And, and that really makes it a, the existing site on Hancock Street really an impossible one for us to, to go in and, and rebuild, um, you know, from, you know, rebuild in, in place or, or expand in place. Um, so let's see, I think we can go to the next, we can go to the next slide. This will be my last one. So when this facility opens in roughly three years, it's gonna house an initial order of, of 45 battery electric buses. Um, and then within a year of opening the facility, the entire fleet out of the Quincy garage will be will be battery electric buses. So these these buses are going to make living next to an MBTA facility a very different experience here than it than it, than it really is for those living around uh, most of our other facilities. These buses are going to be quieter and, and, cl and cleaner than the buses we operate today. And I talked you know at the outset about this 20 year journey that the T is on to electrify its fleet. That's one of the most aggressive um, timelines um, out there in the country. And the plan is to do that by um, doing facility modernization projects like this one every two to three years. So this kind of uh, blue shaded area in the image is kind of showing you that capacity that will increase um, as we as we build each new facility, the capacity that we'll have um, to, to increase our battery electric bus fleet. And this first step down in the bottom left corner there is 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 really the the, the Quincy project. So. Um, you know, to tell us more about, about about the facility that's kicking off this exciting program, I'm going to hand it off uh, to Steve Belanger, who'll take us through the rest of the presentation. Great. Thank you, Scott. Uh, as Scott mentioned, my name is Steve Belanger. I'm a senior project manager for capital delivery at the MBTA. I work with and presented to the city of Quincy as an MBTA PM for the South Shore Garages project, which includes Quincy Adams Garage. Prior to the MBTA, I also worked at Crown Colony Drive for eight years, so I'm familiar with the area. I'm happy to be a part of the project and have the opportunity to provide an update to the community this evening. This project will include a state-of-the-art facility, which is both LEED and Envision certified. The facility will be approximately 364,000 square feet and will support storage and maintenance for up to 120 battery electric buses in an all indoor facility. The facility will include a PV solar array on the roof and the project will include a new shared use pathway for the community, as well as new signalized intersection with the extension of Columbia Street and sidewalk improvements. Next slide, please. This site plan here is an overall map which shows everybody the project site, a general, uh, impact uh, project info, such as the address, lot size, proposed improvements to the pedestrian and vehicular connectivity. You can see the scope and the magnitude of, of the improvements that we're looking to, to do besides just the building, everything that would, would impact the community, connectivity, et cetera. And we can hop to the next slide. Thank you. So this rendering here shows the proposed conditions of the project from a vantage point of the neighborhood pedestrian at Tabor and Columbia. This propo proposed fencing was actually coordinated and communicated with the city of Quincy and a local survey was circulated to the immediate abutters by the city in order to determine a desired look. Based on feedback and our work with our design consultant, we proposed a fence that matches the existing fence along Grasso Park today, which is a 10 foot high, brown vinyl fence with a wood texture look. This fence combined with the proposed trees provides a screened look 
that is also welcoming and aesthetically pleasing while not creating a closed off, undesirable feel. Uh, thank you, next slide, please. This rendering shows the proposed conditions of the project from a vantage point of the neighborhood pedestrian along the Deco apartment building. As you can see here, the building has a softer look and feel than the former Lowe's building. With this building being both LEED and Envision certified, with a rooftop solar array and supporting battery electric buses, the design and construction has been and will continue to be and take into account climate, sustainability, and resiliency, as well as sensitivity to adjacent areas and neighborhoods. This project will be providing connectivity through the site that the community does not currently have with the existing conditions today. Next slide, please. In order to meet our milestones and goals, we split the construction into two separate projects. The early construction activities will include the demolition of the building, as well as surface and subsurface demolition and utility installation in order to enable the next construction project, which will include the building construction. You all may have noticed some activities starting as early as this week with the contractor mobilizing, preparing the site for construction field trailers, tree and vegetation clearing in the parking lot, construction fencing, signage, erosion control, and so on. The actual demolition of the building is planned after the first of this year. And the total duration of the particular construction contract that is out today is relatively short and expected to be completed in the summer of 22. Next slide, please. Including, included as part of the early construction activities contract is the shared use pathway. This will be completed as part of the early construction and ahead of the construction of the new facility building. As you can see in the rendering, a view from the vantage point of a pedestrian on the path looking west. This will provide the community a more direct and safer means to connect Grasso Park to Bergen Parkway. This path will be 10 foot wide and will allow for pedestrians as well as bicyclists. We have also taken into account consideration of lighting and safety with an emergency call box, as you can see here. Next slide, please. Another rendering shows the shared use path from the vantage point of a pedestrian looking east with the proposed facility in the background. Again, this will provide the community a more direct, safer, and pleasant means to connect between Grasso Park and Bergen Parkway, which does not exist today. The next slide, please. I'll now take you through a project timeline. So 75% design for the overall building construction was completed in October of this year. Uh, moving on to the next box, you can see the demolition project begins November 21. That's uh, as early as, as, like I said, this week. 100% design is anticipated to be completed for the overall building in the winter of 22, which is uh, really over in, in the next few months. The shared use pathway is expected to be completed with the completion of the early construction package, which is summer of 22. And then the construction of the building, the next construction package, is expected to be, begin in the summer of 22. And substantial completion of the building is expected late 2024. And also, I just want to mention while we're on the slide, uh, public engagement and updates will be continued throughout the duration of this timeline. Next slide, please. And as I mentioned, the, the MBTA will be providing updates on the project website. You can visit our uh, project website and sign up for to be included in uh, email updates. And with that, that is the conclusion of my presentation today. So I'll hand it back over. Yeah, but, yeah and just before we get into the q and I just want to just uh, thank Senator uh, Keenan who joined us, I think, after we had um, kicked off the start there. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. All right, hi. Hi, my name is Alexandra Markiewicz. I'll be um, 
monitoring the Q and A. So uh, before we begin, lo would love to give our state and local elected officials an opportunity to comment. Thank Senator Keenan, Representative Chan, Councillor Phelan or Palmucci, or anyone else that we may have missed. Okay, and feel free to um, comment at at any time as well. So now I will hop to the questions that come in on the chat or uh, come in through seeing a raised hand. Um, I'll just go back and forth between them and, and we'll see if we, we can get through all of them. So the first question we have is from John Eckblom and it's um, some clarification on the Columbia Street rendering. So. Actually, Diekman, could you go back to the Columbia Street slide, please? Um, the question is, Columbia Street is a straight street, but your art rendering shows a curved road with no park in the photo slide. Where is the straight Columbia Street and where is Grasso Park? Your slide does not make sense. Yeah, um, go back to that slide, Alexandra, and I can, I'm happy to take a look at that. Um, I'm not sure if the screen is, oh, there it is. So here, um, this is actually the, the vantage point here is, is looking, um, I guess it, it's more the park is to the right. So you could see where the fence uh, jog has a 90 degree jog. The existing Grasso Park is on the right side and, and right beside where, where the person is standing is that it's sort of a, uh, there's a gate or uh, the street is blocked off. So this is this is the um, actual conditions of uh, the curvature of the road from my understanding. So, I mean, uh, we're happy to go back and take a look at it, but I'm not sure if maybe um, the expectation was that this, this is a different vantage point. Hopefully that answers the question, but the park is on the right, just off the screen. You could see the grass a little bit of grass old park right there. So John, if you wanna raise your hand or just throw in the chat, if that does not help provide clarity. Um, we have, and the next question is um, regarding the cost estimate. Do we have a total cost estimate for the project? Uh, so I think that would be for Steve. Yeah, we, we actually, we, we, the cost estimate right now is in development. The 100% design is, is not complete at the moment. Um, so right now we're, we're reviewing the cost estimate that we received for the 75%. So because it's still under review and there's still a comment period back and forth, um, I'm assuming that you're referring to the actual construction cost estimate, the building construction. So we'll be happy to, to share more information as, as it gets reviewed and completed internally. So just to loop back, I see that John's raised his hand. So I'm gonna go ahead and unmute so you can, you can provide clarity on that. Can you hear me? Okay, uh, basically when you said pot, if you look at this, diagram where the two with the two people on the left hand side are walking not the ones in the middle but way to the left way to the left you said that this is columbia street my property is a big part of columbia street and the whole part of columbia street is straight all the way down to the park grasso park and then there's a barrier right there. Um, there is no curve at all. So what I'm trying to understand, before I go any further, I'm for this development. So that's not a problem. It's just, I'd like accurate representation here. And if this was Columbia Street, which you're saying it is, you're showing about a 45 degree angle from where the first two people are walking to the other two people. And that, that's, 
that can't be accurate because if you get on the beginning of Columbia Street down by the uh, Dunkin' Donuts that's down there, you can drive down Columbia Street without turning your, your um, steering wheel at all before you hit the barrier. So if you're saying that the park is on the right hand side of it, um, I don't I don't understand um, how you could say this is a representative of Columbia Street. If you could explain that, I'd appreciate it. And I'm not upset about this, so run with the ball. Absolutely, you know, I, I appreciate, we appreciate the comment. Um, I think it might just be more um, vantage points and, and the way that we're looking at this, um, because I, I actually just looked up as well on Google Maps. And I, I think we might be talking about the same thing, but maybe it might be sort of a little, maybe the vantage point that you're thinking of is, is slightly different. Um, so this, I'm happy to kind of take it offline if you want, we can, we can have a chat about it if you'd like to do that. I don't know if we want to pull up the, the Google map in, in this, in the public meeting to look at it together, but I know that our design consultants actually took the existing conditions, um, uh, from the existing mapping, uh, and, and, and put this on, it, it might look a little different because maybe. The, the fence is, is new and proposed and the, the street and sidewalk is, is proposed to be done over. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to satisfy um, your comment in any way possible. Understood. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. It's not necessary for us to go offline or anything. Uh, that's, that's not an issue. Um, I, I guess what, from what you're saying is this perspective must be from where the new construction is for um, the plumbing company looking towards the property. That's the only way, that's the only way I can guess where that is. But 90% um, yes, so. of, of Columbia Street is a straight road and that's where most of the residences are. Yes, I'm understood. So, so if you were standing at Tabor Street looking towards Lowe's, okay. this is, this is, this is me standing at the corner of Tabor and Columbia, looking towards Lowe's, a little bit to the left, looking a little left towards PV Sullivan. Understood. If you and it could... does slightly curve a little bit, and and that's kind of what we're seeing there. Just a little, it, it, you know, might might look a little exaggerated um, because of this vantage point here, but that's maybe the the curbing and the sidewalk is is going to be redone, so maybe it makes it be more prominent in the proposed condition. Understood. It, it, in the future, if you could give another present presentation that number one shows the perspective from Columbia Street further down the road and also shows where the park is in relationship to that, because all what I'm seeing from this presentation here is probably about 50 yards, maybe 100 yards at the most, right at a corner on Columbia Street that basically has been blocked off from the majority of the residences and businesses on Columbia Street. One would think that if you're going to represent Columbia Street, you wouldn't take the very last end of it that the majority of people can't drive on, which is past the park past the road embutments that were put there and maybe give a little better presentation of perspective from Columbia Street itself. But that, that's just my two cents worth. And um, I think you're doing a good job so far. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you, John. We'll um, move to Another another question about particulars, since we're on this topic, is it possible to widen the sidewalks around the property near any roads with fast moving traffic? So Steve, I think that's another one for you. Yeah, so for this one, what we were, we're actually proposing to match existing curb lines um, because it's a relatively um, tight area. We don't, we didn't want to start decreasing the road width, increasing sidewalk widths. That's more of, um, this is the, the, the city's property here. We really wanted to stick with what's there today and just improve on it instead of once you start changing the road layout, 
it makes other implications. So we really just tried to stick with what, what is there today. Steve, would you want to, um, would it be worth just talking a little bit about the Bergen Parkway? So they may have been, I think, probably talking about this side, but the Bergen Parkway side, because that sidewalk we're going to be doing some work on. Oh, right. Yes, exactly. Right. And so along the Bergen Parkway facing side, and maybe we can pull up the map that shows the overall, I believe it's the slide eight, if I'm not mistaken. So this, uh, as you can see here along the bottom of the page running left to right is the sidewalk along Bergen Parkway. Ooh. And that sidewalk is, is going to be reconstructed and it's going to be uh, slightly um, widened to, to make sure that, that there's a pedestrian connectivity there from between the two streets. So we'll we'll be working on that sidewalk as well. So there'll be there'll be work uh, basically around the whole property, with the exception of the, the Grasso Park, right in front of Grasso Park. All right. Um, moving along, we have another question. Um, do you have an estimate on how much energy is used to charge the buses? that's used to charge the buses will come from the solar panels installed on the facility roof. And let me just sc scroll back up from Julian. I think oh. that's for you, Steve, though, Scott, you might want to chime yeah. in there as well. Yeah, Scott, did you want to kick it off and I can complete it? Oh. No, you're you're on such a roll there. I I, I couldn't remember how to. <laughs> I'm happy to myself. start. <laughs> yeah. So so the 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 building is being set up to accommodate uh, solar panels on the roof. But the way the MBTA does that is they end up sort of contracting uh, that out. So where so so the building is being designed so that it it it's it's solar ready and and it can be outfitted with solar. That's the intent. And our environmental team at the T will be will be working on um, getting that contract in place. However, we will not be you know, we'll not be relying on that on that power uh, to, to power the buses. We'll be we've been coordinating with National Grid, the electric utility in Quincy over the past two years, um, and we've uh, submitted a request to them uh, to ensure that this facility has got enough power to power both the building and, and our bus fleet. Yeah, and I could just add to that as well. So and for the um, solar panels on the roof, they're actually lead and envision requirements for those. And so the MBTA is, is still working with the design consultant to determine the best way uh, to utilize that power. And as Scott, Scott mentioned, we're not really going to just rely only on the solar panels. Uh, actually, the solar panels, believe it or not, uh, they're, they're huge, but the building and, and the, um, the battery buses require a, a lot of energy. Uh, to, to charge them. So we didn't want to, we don't really want to put ourselves in, in a box relying on those. There's different ways to handle the, the energy credits and, and um, we're working with our environmental group right now to determine the, the best usage for that. Okay, we have um, another one about um, some of the early construction activities from Fay. Why are the tree, why, what trees are you cutting down and why is that necessary? Yes, Faye, thank you for the for the comment. So the actual, the site itself is, um, the full site is going to be reworked as part of the entire project. So the early construction project includes the demolition of the actual parking lot itself, the islands, the vegetation. We're going to be reinstalling pavement. We're going to be restriping, installing new islands installing some stormwater, a surface stormwater control. So detention, retention basins in some areas. So unfortunately we have to clear out the site um, that we have to make room to install underground utilities as well. 
but there will be new trees installed. So this is just part of the, of the whole overall scope of the project. And then should have asked this earlier when we were talking about traffic, but from ML, um, were you able, would you be able to show that well, actually, this is that that bird's eye view. So we'll just stick on this slide, but to speak to the traffic plan for Penn Street, which is currently a dead end and and in this plan is is changing to be a through street. Yes, let me just um, I'm just trying to flag that comment so I can see. Um, so that what was the specific question? I'm, I'm trying to find it was just explain explain the plans for Columbia at Penn? Yes. Um, so, yes. Yeah. So the we've been working with the city of Quincy because these these will eventually be public roads. But however, we'll, we'll be constructing them. So the plan is to have the, the road restricted um, only to authorized vehicles. And it will be enforced using signage. So that's the current plan. We're working with the uh, traffic parking and lighting department at the city of Quincy. And they've been helpful in, in providing us some, some suggestions. So we're gonna be proposing signage on the, uh, the end, at both ends of, of uh, Penn Street, as well as signage along uh, Bergen Parkway. So there'll be authorized vehicles only, which um, sh should help re restrict. We went through and we, we had a lot of different ideas. We talked about physical barriers, but that kind of that posed a lot of different issues, so uh, including even uh, response, a uh, fire response, so emergency response as well. So um, this is the the plan that we came up with after we've exhausted a lot of different options. Okay, and when will the project go out for bid for full construction? The plan right now is to put it out to bid around the spring of 22. And then just another, um, just because it's relevant to some of the early construction act activities that we've been talking about, um, it came in a little later from Ron, what sort of noise pollution and physical pollution, e.g. dust or other debris, can we expect from the demolition phase? So we have a standard language in our contract specifications for all any any and all projects. They're they're very similar. The contractor is required to submit to us the MBTA for review their plans on how they're going to minimize uh, any any noise, or they're supposed to uh, also provide dust control for the site. So as of now, because we, we're just getting started. We're still working through all those details. So anything like that needs to be reviewed and approved by the MBTA. Um, but as of now, um, we're not looking at anything really just typical day shifts. We, we don't expect anything currently planned for any night shifts or double shifts or weekends at the moment. If, if anything does change, uh, as I mentioned before, public outreach will continue. And everybody can go on the website to look for updates and sign up, sign up for email updates if you're interested. But there is control over that. And we also have to, there's noise level monitoring that's required. There's um, many different uh, levels of monitoring that's required by the contractor. Great. Great. I hope that was helpful for you, Ron. Um, we have a couple questions that are kind of about the, the project overview and scope. So from Ari and Jay, can you clarify the total size of this garage? At, in previous presentations, um, it was 135 and here it's 120 and are they all 40 foot buses? And then what are the dimensions of the building? I think maybe Sc Scott, you wanna start and then Steve can follow on on this one. Yeah, I'll answer um, Ari's question on the buses and then Steve talk about the dimensions. Yeah, so so the um, the building we had it permitted for 135 buses when we went through the environmental review process. We we think this facility could probably uh, fit 135 buses. If you look at 
some of our other facilities around the T network, we get very creative in how we can kind of find spaces to kind of jam uh, buses in there. But you know, really the goal for this facility was to have a, a more efficient workspace for our employees. And we permitted it for 135 just so that we wouldn't have to go back in the future if there ever you know, was a need to have that many buses here. Um, but but we've been talking, and I think at the last meeting, we'd been already describing it as 120 bus fleet is what we think this is, which we think is this sort of optimal fleet size um, for this facility. We are, however, I do wanna, um, you know, emphasize this facility is replacing an 86 bus um, facility over at Hancock Street. So there's not uh, necessarily a commitment to to fill this to 120 on day one for, for Quincy service. Our, our initial priority is gonna be um, replacing that old diesel fleet from Hancock Street, those 86 buses with 86 uh, new buses at this location, but we, we are um, kind of designing it ideally for 120 bus fleet. And uh, to the second part of Ari's question, yes, it's, uh, an entirely 40 foot uh, fleet at this facility, uh, as opposed to the approach we're taking with some of the next facilities in the program. Yep, and Scott, just to add to that. So uh, the size, uh, as I mentioned before, 364,000 square foot, it'll be three stories um, and 69 foot tall at its, at its highest peak. I don't wanna get, go and start quoting dimensions right now because it, it's, I can give, send that information. I'm happy to send that over if you want to share your information. Um, I don't know the, the different jogs off the top of my head, and I don't want to uh, kind of say it on the spot here, but um, those are the general specs of it, and I'm happy to send you some, I guess, longest and widest dimension if that's, uh, if that's exactly what you were looking for. And as Steve, um, and as Steve mentioned earlier in the presentation as well, there's, you know, a, I, I think you referenced this, Steve, there is a pr proportion of that that is sort of third floor yeah. kind of office and storage space that's not directly, you know, related necessarily to the functions of the facility. And that's that kind of vertical rectangle on the right side of the image on the screen. Right, thank you, Scott, for, for clarifying that exactly. Right, that the full, it's not a full third story. Um, yes, that's correct. And then um, from Shelly, a question, a uh, clarification question about the shared use path. Um, if it's 10 feet wide, will it be divided for bicyclists and pedestrians or shared? And have we gotten any input on whether pedestrians prefer kind of sharing access with faster move, moving bicycles or not? And then a second part of it. So the first part might be um, for Scott, uh, since I was the, from the origin of the shared use path. And then the second part of it is, will the MBTA plow during the winter? And if not, who will? And I'll push that to Steve. Uh, Scott, do you want to take the first first part of that one at the origin of the shared use pathway? Oh, you're on mute. Hi, uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, so so the um, you know the the. The public has the right of kind of access across the the existing site at at Lowe's to to access primarily our 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 red line station across the street. So we knew when we came in and built this facility, the MBTA needs to kind of have a kind of secure perimeter, uh, unlike a unlike a you know a shopping center like the Lowe's. So we knew we needed to create pedestrian access for residents from Tabor Street, Columbia Street that want to come over and access the red line. Um, and we came up with, a, initially it was just to be a sidewalk that was going to follow the southern end of the site along where that red line, that curved red line is um, on the image here. And one of the comments we got at that first meeting, I think it may have been the, the meeting in January of 2020 that Councillor Palmucci hosted. Um, we did hear from folks that um, the that rather than a, a, a just a sidewalk width, that we should try to widen the widen that um, passageway to to ten feet, which would which is the sort of the dimensions of a shared use path. So that would make it a little bit wider, make it comfortable for a bicyclist uh, and a pedestrian to kind of pass each other um, on 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 this stretch. So that's kind of the origins of how we we landed at the ten foot. That's a that's a standard dimension for a um, you know minimum dimension for a shared use path. Great, and I'll take the last portion of that. So will the MBTA plow during the winter? If not, who will? That is something that the MBTA will be talking with the city of Quincy about. And uh, we, don't, we don't have the answer to that at the moment, but we will be figuring that out with the city of Quincy um, who will be sharing uh, that responsibility. 
Okay, and we had had a follow up from ML. Um, thank you, who said thanks for the the information on Penn Street as a follow up. Um, is the shed on the south side of the Caniff property being removed to allow for the Columbia Street extension to be installed? Steve, I think that's for you. Yes, so if I am assuming correctly, um, if there's a shed uh, right in the direction of where we're extending Columbia Street, then yes. And that is something that we'll be working out with the, uh, with the Caniff Monument, uh, Caniff and Sun Monument, Monument Company. So we're talking, our real estate and legal groups are talking with the Caniff property to let them know what, what our plans are and how we're gonna handle that. Hopefully that answers the question. And yet, Steve, there is a small shed there on that edge of the okay. property. Yep. Yes, and we, we would be moving it um, and working out the best way. Thank you, Richard. We'd be working out the best way to handle that with the owner of the property. Okay, it looks like we have about three more questions. The slide deck will be available on the website um, tomorrow. Just just uh, saw that last one come in, but other than that, there's about three more. So from Jay, um, a question about the parking spots, why we have two, 200 parking spots, um, what we expect in terms of uh, operators and um, our maintenance staff taking the tea to work. Uh, do you want me to start with that one, Steve? And then sure. you wanna, or you no, can, you can great, Scott. Yeah. No, no, uh, if this came from, um, you might have, you know, the, the program background um, to share. Please. Yeah, no, I, I think, I think um, to Jay's question, yeah, I think we, we sort of approached the site similar to how the, the Lowe's Home Improvement Store approached it. There, there is the, the Town Brook does sort of bisect uh, the site in a culvert and, and the Lowe's, the Lowe's facility is, is sort of, you know, to the to the east of that, and then they've they've got the rest for customer parking on the west side. There, um, we certainly are. My my team certainly is is very pro transit, and and Alexander and I are, are definitely you know looking to minimize the amount of employee parking we need at facilities. However, at you know at 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 maintenance facilities and operations facilities, a lot of our workforce is arriving at work or leaving work at, at times when the service um, is not available, and and. Frankly, I think we were we were looking to not have a structure kind of span the the culvert anyway. So the the, the parking lot felt like the kind of you know um, logical choice of how to lay that out. Um, you know, we we think we've got enough parking here for for our workforce um, that that needs it. But but yeah, when you're dealing with our our maintenance crews or our bus operators that are pulling out at five in the morning, we do need to give them a way to get to work. Yep, and and I can add uh, to that. Actually, we do have a number of um, green spaces as well. So to comply with lead and envision, we have a, we are actually encouraging um, vehicles that are electric vehicles, so or and or green vehicles. All right, a couple more, um, but kind of related to to the trees again um, from Faye. How many trees are we planting and what are we doing also related to the parking to prevent heat islands caused by concrete? So I don't have, I, I'm happy to share the number of, of trees from the landscape plan. The 100% design is still in development. So likely uh, would have changed from the 75%, but we have a landscape architect on board. Um, you can see here all, all the, in general, all the green space that we're adding to, to the parking lot. So uh, actually exact number of trees, I don't, I don't have that information with me today, but I'm happy to send that if you wanna share your email, we can share that information. And um, I can also check with our design consultants to, to give you a, a engineering answer to the question of heat islands caused by the concrete. Uh, there is concrete there today. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't be uh, really increasing or, or changing the amount in the parking lot. Alexandra and Steve, I, I, a message came into me, direct message. I'm not sure if it was intended for me, a direct message, but it's a question. I won't, I won't say who asked it in case they were attempting to be anonymous by just messaging me. But the question was, um, will Columbia Street remain a dead end? Um, will the barriers now in place remain as they are? 
and then please show it on the plans going forward. So, uh, Steve, do you want to take that? Yes, absolutely. So I think that is referring to how it's blocked. Uh, it's preventing from going down towards Crown Colony Drive towards Dunkin' Donuts. We will not, we have no plans to touch that barrier or that dead end portion. And actually you can see here in this drawing, uh, there's a, a line, a black line that comes across. It says no access. So that is going to remain no access. Um, wherever that, if that is likely an approximate spot, wherever the existing spot is today, it will remain. Okay, I hope that that provided clarity to that person. Um, we have another a follow up from John um, from early, who we heard from earlier. Can you give a rough timeline timetable for the demolition begin as to the demolition begin date after receiving um, quotes? What would be the rough completion date? We realize there's a lot of variables. I, I'm guessing, John, you're asking about like specifically the, the days we expect that the building would be demolished within this early construction activities. Yes, so if, I guess if that is, I mean, maybe we can hop to the timeline table, uh, sorry, slide. I believe it's slide um, 14. And we can we can look at that quickly. So just to give everybody a general feel, uh, like I mentioned earlier, this demolition project is relatively a short contract. So the notice to proceed was issued to the contractor in November, and it will be completed by the summer of 22. So that's a very short duration. All we can say right now is that the demolition, uh, like I mentioned earlier, it won't happen this year. It will happen after the first of the year. But because the baseline schedule is not uh, fully vetted and reviewed and accepted by the MBTA, I don't really, uh, we're not prepared to, to say a date or even a month at this moment, but it will be, it will be after the first and the project will be complete when we say by the summer of 22. So hopefully, I mean, as we get more information, if you wanna share your, your email, uh, we, we're happy to share more details as we're able to. Oh, Scott, you're- uh, Okay. Yeah, I just I had another. Um, I was just calling uh, Maureen because she had she she sent me a chat message directly to myself, and I just I was just checking with her to make sure we could share with the whole group. So Alexander, why don't you go to the next okay. question? I'm going to copy a question from Maureen into the chat. All right, sounds good. So we've got another couple related to parking. Um, as a follow up, Ari wants to know why operators couldn't park at the Quincy Adams garage. Um, depending on demand over the next, um, the life cycle of the, the garage, I guess, um, which is lower post COVID, uh, which would allow for more green space in the facility. Um, I think, well, Steve, do you wanna start and Scott? I mean, I can start on some thoughts. I mean, this, this is really a question for, you know, maybe even the parking department <laughs> at the T. But I know that, that that might cause a lot of controversy, just being myself, um, a previous project manager for the Quincy Bus Garage. When we were looking to close parking to uh, rehab the garage, uh, that was, that was a, a big concern. And I know that there's a COVID right now, but we don't know when, if, if or when numbers will come back. So um, that, that might be a tough decision for us to make to, to you know, give up parking that the public could be using to, to take our system. Um, but I mean, Scott, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that, but this is more of a, you know, the parking department question. I know that the Braintree and Quincy Adams garages are two of the most used in, in highest uh, number garages. They get filled up by 7 a.m. Uh, before COVID. So. Yeah, no, I think, I think, I don't know that I have much to add. I think that, um, you know, we're all, um, I don't know if that was, was that Ari that asked that question? I think we're all, you know, optimistic that transit's going to come back and, and be where it was pre-COVID and, and grow. And I think that, yeah, this is, uh, it's, 
that garage serves kind of a dual purpose now and it's it's well located relative to the highway network so it's a great place for us to get um, South Shore folks are trying to get on the red line and avoid a driving trip into downtown, which is exactly what we want to encourage. And, you know, it also, um, it's also a revenue stream for the T. So we need to, we need, we need to sort of, like Steve says, make sure we're not, you know, sacrificing revenue and, and customer access. But, you know, I, I think it's, that's the type of thing, right, that can certainly be looked at in the future. If we're sitting here 10 years from now, five years after the facility opens and this, and this lot's never more than half full, you know, there could be discussions about how we use that space. And likewise, if if red line ridership does not return to where it was or demand for the station doesn't return, then I think, yeah, that's something that could be explored down the road. But I think right now we're 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 trying to be optimistic and hope that hope that ridership comes all the way back and, and continues the, the growth trajectory it was on before COVID. All right, so we've had a couple more questions that have come in um, in the last few minutes. So we'll just keep chugging through. Um, from Faye, another question about parking and also looking to the future, um, how many EV charging stations there will be for employees? Uh, Steve, can you um, take that one? Yes, so uh, as of now, I believe there are um, I believe there are about 12 to 14 uh, spots reserved for green vehicles. So, um, you know, some of them include level one and level two chargers. Great. And um, another question, shifting gears um, to the bidding. Uh, from Craig, will the contractors that are bidding on the project need to submit a statement of qualification that falls under chapter 149? Steve. So the procurement, we have a, a, our procurement group at the MBTA would handle any requirements that are needed for a contractor. To, I, I believe the contractors also need to be pre-qualified before they can bid. So they could, uh, you could take out plans and look at them. But in order to bid, you have to be accepted and pre-qualified uh, for the work. So we work with our, closely with our procurement department to determine uh, estimated value for which, which category of work. So this one here for the demo is demolition. Um, so for building, they'd have to be pre-qualified for each category of work in order to be allowed to bid. So um, hopefully that answers the question. Any, any necessary category would be determined by our procurement group. Okay, just a quick um, positive shout out before we get to um, the next question that comes from Maureen. So th uh, thank you from Shelly. Um, very pleased about the T's commitment to transitioning to buses, uh, electric buses on day one. So thanks for that um, encouragement, Shelly. So Maureen's question that, that Scott was able to type into the chat is about living directly across the, the street from the park, requested the MBTA put in a 14 foot sound barrier fence, an attractive 14 foot sound barrier fence, but was told that it, um, a noise test had been done and that we it showed that we didn't need one. So the question is when was the noise test done and where is the power, uh, the power grid or the substation or any electrical um, infrastructure gonna be located? Um, so I think, Scott, I'll put this to you since the noise test occurred in the, in the earlier part of the design. Um, and then Steve, you can add anything after. Yeah, I think I think I would just say, you know, Steve touched on it, uh, Maureen, you know, during the presentation that, you know, we, it's, it's tough to come up with a solution that everybody you know, everybody is gonna, everybody's gonna like, right? And and I know that um, we didn't really have a perfect way to kind of um, to 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 kind of take this to a vote, but we did work, um, you know, with with the city and and, and with the council to get a kind of poll uh, done in the neighborhood and the the existing fence that's out there at Grasso Park. I think was considered to be more, you know, that that was that was sort of what people seemed to like in terms of the fence treatments around the lows, whereas once you got down closer to the plumbing supply company and Caniff and you had the see-through fence or the shorter fence, it seemed like people didn't want to go uh, that route. So, you know, that that's that sort of what steered the team to the design decision. I think Steve can talk to the sort of, 
maybe Steve, you could talk to just the conditions under which you would do something like a noise wall and, and maybe why this, you know, and I, and bef you know, before handing out to Steve, just again, a reminder, this, this really is going to be a, a, a different type of bus facility than other MBTA facilities. These are going to be uh, battery electric buses within the first year of the facility opening. They're going to be much quieter. This is an all indoor um, bus maintenance facility. So we have a lot of facilities where we've got activities happening kind of out in the yard. That's, that's not going to be the case at, at this facility. And then our traffic analysis did show that, you know, as compared to a Lowe's home improvement store, in, ter in terms of the number of vehicles that are going to be coming in, particularly coming onto this side of the site um, where the parking is, it's going to be a much lower level of, of activity. Um, so just wanted to put that out there for context, but I'll let Steve speak to the kind of design decisions. And Yeah, and, and um, the way that we explained it previously was that we, it, it wasn't, it's not warranted at this site to have an actual noise barrier. I think the way that when we discussed it previously, it was more like uh, a noise barrier similar to what's along a highway. And really, I mean, if you think about it, highways are very noisy. So that in that case, something like that uh, is determined that it would be warranted. So um, we have to take into consideration also uh, the cost as well. So uh, those walls are much more costly, but also just kind of looking at, at the overall neighborhood itself, we actually, uh, we believe that this building with the lead and envision certification and the battery electric buses, this is something that that it will be soft to see. Uh, you can see that that's why we took that vantage point is specifically um, to, to respond to, to the concern because we know we, we heard your comments and um, we're trying to work the best we can to provide something that will, will appease um, you know the residents as much as possible. But at the same time, not look like it's uh, off-putting or closed off. It, the fence is close to, to the sidewalk. And in some cases, there's not even a, a thick landscape buffer because of the, the way the road layout is. So uh, people would be walking along almost a wall um, and, and it was recommended and, and we all decided and determined that um, a fence versus a noise barrier, noise barrier um, wouldn't really serve much of a purpose by stopping a low, little to low, no noise. Um, it, all it would do is just kind of block what you would see visually. So you wouldn't even see the new trees. Maybe it would block the tree line. So we want we want people to be able to see that welcoming view. And that's kind of that you know our design consultants work, worked worked uh, together to determine that. And hopefully that answers the question. And, and we're happy to Scott and I uh, talk with you offline, and we're, we're happy to continue those discussions if. If you need more information, How about yeah, I apologize, Maureen, that the uh, apologize that the question got didn't didn't come through. I know you asked it much earlier in the meeting. Apologies that we didn't get it until now. That's okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Thank you, Maureen. Uh, did you tell me where the power uh, station? Oh, gonna... sorry, I missed that that portion. Yes, yeah. so it, it'll be the. When you say the power grid, are you oh, referring uh, to yeah. the, the substation, whatever they substation. call it? Yeah, yeah it'll, there'll be a switching station at the corner of the former Penn driveway or the Deco driveway that we call it, and Bergen Parkway. So at the corner, uh, you can kind of see small words here, small text, proposed electrical substation. Oh, yeah, yeah. Switching station. I see. Okay. Now, does that cause any issues uh, health-wise with the, I've heard, you know, some bad things about that. Um, not that I'm aware of. Uh, okay. No, what anything, any specific concerns, you can send them along to us, but this is a, this is a standard uh, item, standard design element. But if you have any specific concerns on, let us know and we're happy to respond directly to them okay as far as health, you know, health or, or um, and like like i have mentioned to uh scott before after it gets up and running should we find that it is very noisy can we go back and take a look at it that's my main concern this fence that is existing now is very attractive but we did hear a lot of noise even with that fence so I mean, you know, 
I'm will, willing to give it a go. I think, you know, you'd say it's not going to be noisy. I'll yeah, Maureen, I, I guess I would just, um, yeah, I guess what I would say, Maureen, is, is you know, we um, we want to be a good neighbor, right? I mean, um, I think we, we, we certainly hope that, um, you know, the MBTA is going to be, um, you know, someone that it's going to be a lot easier for you to get in touch with than like the corporate parents of Lowe's or who, you know, whoever was on this, this site before we, we, you know, we think it's, you know, you, we've, we saw at the beginning of the meeting, your elected officials that were, you know, that are in the room tonight. And, and I think they, they certainly know how to, how to get in touch with us if, if there are problems. Um, but it also, you know, I, sh I showed that chart that showed the journey that we're on. It's a 20 year yeah. program to electrify the whole fleet and rebuild all these facilities. And we're yeah. not going to, we're not well, going to I, I hope I'm here in 20 years. I don't think I'll be here in 20 years to get back. <laughs> yeah, well, I wasn't, I, I, I hope you, I hope you will be Maureen, that, but that wasn't, I was, I do I was too. More, yeah, I was, it was more that, um, more just that we can't, if, if we do a bad job here and we're trying to rebuild a facility at, at Arbor Way or rebuild a facility in Lynn, it's just not gonna, we wanna be able to point to this facility and, and what a good neighbor we are when we're when we're out in those communities. So it's, it's in our interest to be um, a good neighbor here. Well, I don't wanna take up too much more time, but I was gonna ask about, you know, um, I think somebody already touched on about the demolition, the dust and the, rodent control and the lighting will the lighting be it's a 24 7 outfit that you're going to be running uh will the lights be on you know sometimes the lights where they're really bright can shine on over on the side of the street so i guess that'll all be addressed in another yeah. meeting right. well maureen um just like scott said we're, we're here and we want to be a good neighbor so but I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, expect that this to be a 24-7 uh, operation. So okay. as of now, and, and I know that the baseline schedule is still is still being looked at, but there's no there's no plans for this to be a 24-7 operation. This is a, a typical construction project, typical demolition project. Oh no, and, I um, know. I, I yeah, meant to and, I have to, yeah. yeah, and the noise, what time they will start, what time will they end? Yeah, so typical construction hours, 7 a.m start uh and by sometimes three between three and five to, to demobilize and shut the shut yeah. the machines off right um so it, it really i think as far as lighting they they likely will have lighting to make sure everything's adequately lit for pedestrians to cut through the site because we have to yeah. provide that's our number one is making sure that we provide access through the site because everybody we know uh, cuts through it so keeping everybody safe so that will be lit for safety uh, yeah. As far as lighting for construction, if they're not really working at nighttime, maybe in the morning, early morning, it might be dark or uh, early afternoon, but we're willing to work work with you. Let us know. Um, Scott and I are here, but we have field staff on site at all times during construction. So the MBTA field inspectors and resident engineers will be watching the work to make sure everything's adequate and that the contract is following all contract requirements. That includes rodent control. A rodent control plan was submitted. It's under review right now. It also includes dust control, noise monitoring. Okay. Et cetera. Um, thanks, Maureen. And so I was gonna ask Christine's question about rodent control, but I think you just touched on that. So Christine, feel free to message if, if that wasn't a um, sufficient answer. We have about, Four questions left. I'll just ask one that also came in to me directly um, before getting to a few of the bigger picture ones. So will the flower planter at the end of Tabor remain closing off um, Columbia Street? Yeah, I believe that's what I was trying to think of when I said what's something's there. I don't think it was a gate. It's the flower planter. We, we don't have any plans to, to remove that or change that. Okay, great. I hope um, that helps answer that person's question. Um, and then let's see, it looks like we've got three more. And then I, I might just ask this one because it's on a topic we've been talking about. Um, the greenery and foliage may be helpful for noise mitigation, would help mitigate, I guess this isn't actually as much a question from Betty, but would help mitigate heat island effect and any vehicle emissions that may come from the facility parking lot. So just a, 
a, a, a good suggestion on, on the benefits of, of greenery and foliage. Um, and then it looks like we've got, thanks, Christine, I see your note there. Um, we've got a couple more questions. One, I believe it's from Faye on the infrastructure bill. bill. Thank you, Julian, for joining. Um, how will Biden's infrastructure bill that funds more public transportation affect the MBTA? Um, Scott, do you want to start on that one? Uh, sure. Yeah. Obviously, it's it's um, it's something that MBTA and and MassDOT leadership have been spending a lot of time um, thinking about uh, over the past several months in anticipation of the bill getting passed. I think everyone's excited that it passed. I think the the general manager. I think at yesterday's board meeting, I think, you know, made a really, you know, appropriate comment, which is there's, you know, there's probably a lot more ideas out there for how to spend um, the additional funds than, than, than there are additional funds, uh, but clearly it, it will help. And we think that this, this program, um, both, you know, this facility itself, which we, which we do have funding uh, already programmed and committed for, um, but certainly the next steps in our program, we think are, are excellent candidates for that, but there are a lot of needs across the T and, and across, um, you know, across, across transit, across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So we're, we're just, we're just one of those, but, but uh, yeah, certainly, certainly the infrastructure bill will, will, will be a positive for the T. Okay. And then, okay, we're seeing a couple of good goodbyes. So, uh, or, oh, wait, no, I'm scrolling down a couple more goodbyes. So um, there's one more question, I guess, since we are nearing the end, I'd just like to encourage anyone who has a, any last question to just pop it in the chat or raise your hand um, now. And um, then we can make sure to get to it. So the last question that I see here is why are the costs per bus so much higher than anywhere else. Um, Springfield just built a bigger facility for 54 million. Yeah, I can, I guess I can. First, Scott, I think to start on that one. Yeah, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, so I can, I can take that one. Yeah, so I think that, um, you know, we, we've certainly had conversations with our peers around the country, um, you know, where we want to do eight or nine of these projects. So we're trying to learn from our peers around the country. I think it can be difficult to answer Jay's question um, with any specificity without having a lot more information on, you know, the other facilities he's referencing or, or, the, or the Springfield one. I think Steve talked earlier about how our costs, we're, we're, still, re we're still reviewing the 75% uh, cost estimate. Um, so that one isn't even locked down and then, and then the costs will continue to evolve. I, you know, so it's, it's really important for us to kind of know um, whether it's an apples to apples comparison, I don't, uh, I'll admit, I don't know that the, P I don't believe the PVTA facility opened as an all battery electric bus facility. I don't know whether it's, it's, it's lead or envision, um, gold certified. I don't, I don't have enough information on what their program is. We've, for example, we have that 70,000 square feet of our facility is for sort of unrelated MBTA office and, and storage needs. So it's not, you know, it, it may be that Springfield or other facilities also have, you know, a big chunk of what they're building um, sort of allocated to non facility specific uses. I just, you know, I don't, I don't really know. I do know from talking to uh, some of the peers that Alexandra and I have talked to that, um, you know, oftentimes the numbers that are easiest to get uh, publicly are sort of the numbers that sort of construction contract numbers. So, you know, we're carrying, you know, tens of millions of dollars in our in our latest sort of cost estimates for things like contingencies, design contingencies, construction contingencies, escalation. Um, so certainly, you know, it's important if the if you're, we're comparing us to a facility that opened three, four or five years ago, it's important to remember, you know, cost escalation that we're, we're building into our number, um, contingencies that hopefully will go down as we as we get to final design and into construction. But um, yeah, I think we would just want I think more specifics on the program and it's and it's it can be difficult um you know without having like you know long conversations with our colleagues and other systems to really make sure you know we're we're comparing apples to apples but we're certain like i said we're we're trying to the infrastructure bill is not going to fund this entire program certainly so we're we if we're going to you know keep this work moving and, and move on to our next facility and, and deliver this um this program for the whole system we need to we need to keep looking for opportunities to, to try to build these facilities as efficiently as we can. So we're, 
we're continuing to do that. Um, and, um, and yeah, I just, again, I would just need more specifics on who we're being compared to before I could speak to it definitively. So um, speaking of that uh, third floor area that you mentioned, aside from bus maintenance um, and operators, who else will operate out of this facility is another question that we got from Matt. Yeah, I guess I'll take, take that one. Um, yeah, so we, we haven't programmed this, this space yet. When we started this project, um, you know, we, we knew we were going to have to acquire property, and 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 this is a this is an attractive site, right? So that it's not surprising that the cost to acquire this site was was not inconsequential, and that and that's frankly that's true everywhere uh, that we're looking where we need to either expand the footprint of an existing facility or find a new location. We know that um, that's going to cost a lot of money, no matter where we go. You know, sometimes I think Alexander and I wish we had like a time machine to go back 20 years because there's a lot of neighborhoods that our facilities are in that would have been a lot less expensive to acquire property in um, a generation ago. So I, I think given the investment that the MBTA is going to have to make in some of these locations on for property acquisition, um, our, our leader just sh sh just felt that it was important that we build in some space that we can accommodate other uses. And, and obviously, this is another place where COVID has kind of you know, pulled the ball away from us a little bit, right? And in, in terms of, you know, we're, we're still trying to get a handle on what our actual in-office uh, needs are gonna be. Are they gonna be more? Are they gonna be less than, than they have his, been historically? I think the, 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 um, the jury's still out on that one, but certainly when we began this process and, and certainly today having additional space for office um, offices um, or for storage, not like storing heavy industrial equipment, but but sort of lighter storage. The T has, um, you know, has consistently had needs in those areas, and we anticipate that we'll we'll make good use of that level. Although we don't currently have the users identified. So, Matt, I think um, given that answer, I, I hope that it helps answer your follow up, which was about um, the transit sp police specifically and the space that they. Um, use at Quincy Center ending reaching the end of its life. Um, we have another couple questions. Can we talk more about the benefits of replacing the old buses? Like what improvement will be made between the old buses and the new buses? Maybe Scott, you want to start with that one? Uh, sure. Yeah. So the, the, the fleet that we've got operating out of the Hancock Street facility is our um, it's essentially our oldest diesel um, bus fleet. They're buses that were um, acquired between 2006 and 2009, uh, which means that they're they're currently uh, 12 to 15 years old. So by the time you know, by the time um, you know, Steve keeps this project on its current timeline for 2024. By the time we open, uh, those buses are going to be um, doing quick math, eight to 15 to 18 years old. So that's that's getting older than than we feel confident. Um, that we can keep those buses reliable and keep them out on the street. Um, and as we showed in those earlier pictures about the existing Quincy facility, we're not really giving our, our, our machinists and our mechanics at the Quincy facility the best conditions to kind of keep that fleet up and running. Um, the facility we're building them here is going to really give them the, all the tools they need to do their job and, and do it well. So it's, it's a combination of, of older buses. They're just going to naturally become more reliable and more prone uh, to breakdowns, coupled with the fact that the environment in which our staff is going to be trying to maintain them is 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 old and archaic, and then I think on the environmental side, the the clear benefit is that we're going to be uh, transitioning out what are our dirt, you know, you know, you know, highest emissions vehicles in in our fleet today. These these oldest diesel buses, because each each generation of diesel bus that we bought got cleaner, and then we started buying hybrid diesel buses. These are straight diesel buses. Um, so they're going to have higher emissions than the rest of our fleet. So replacing those with battery electric buses is going to be a you know huge huge um, reduction in emissions. So those are the three big ways I think I would I would say um, that this will be a, an improvement for for bus riders in the community. So Deekman, could you go to the schedule slide so we can get the last two questions answered here um, from John. He, he may have missed the answer before, but if, um, but if all runs to schedule kind of 
demolition, construction, like when will the building be finished? And then from Christine, when when are we gonna host another meeting? Or do we plan, when do we, do we plan to check in with um, the residents and, and when? Well, she didn't ask when, but might yep. as well throw that in. <laughs> sure, yeah, I, I can field this one. So yes, the right here, this late 2024, that's the plan when, when the building will be uh, substantially complete, everything's online, we're looking to occupy the building. There may be some testing and, and, and et cetera, some trainings, but substantially complete 2024 uh, late. And we usually come out uh, to the public when construct uh, prior to construction beginning. So prior to the building construction, when that notice to proceed is issued right around that time in the summer of 22 next year, that's when we'll, we plan to come back again to the public to provide an update. And there'll also be updates uh, throughout on the, uh, the construction and design on our project website. And feel free to send your information to the email, the Quincy bus email as well. You can sign up for updates and email blasts. Yeah, that's actually a perfect segue. So I don't see any other questions coming in. Um, so this you know, meeting was recorded as you know, and it will be available on the MBTA um, site later, uh, probably kind of sometime next week. Um, and we definitely encourage you guys to continue to share your comments with quinzyboss at mbta.com. If you um, would like to get regular updates, just send that send an email to quinzyboss at mbta.com. Um, and you can also visit the website for, for updates. So I think those are um, just all of the, the key closing remarks and um, we hope everyone has a really lovely evening. All right.